All right, well, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out to BitDevs LA, uh, Socratic Seminar number 19. Um, just wanted to welcome everyone. And you know, before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, River Financial. They are the best place to buy Bitcoin. And they also have Lightning Network withdrawals, which is like super cool. And uh, if you guys are looking for a place to purchase Bitcoin, I highly recommend checking out River Financial. Uh, today, we have an amazing speaker. His name is Dario, and he is from Moon Wallet. And um, yeah, you know, Dario, why don't we just go straight into it? I'll let you kind of share your screen, start your presentation, and even introduce yourself. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm Dario. I'm the CEO of uh, Moon Wallet, um, and we've been working uh, at Moon on on making a, a really easy to use non-custodial wallet for Bitcoin, and that means both uh, Bitcoin and Lightning Network. Uh, and so I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about how we got here uh, and why we're working um, so uh, so much on non-custodianship. Um, and then maybe dig a little bit into, into how Moon does uh, what it does, how, how we think about um, Bitcoin wallets. And yeah, so uh, feel free to, to ask any questions uh, at any time uh, and we can, uh, uh, we can do it together. Okay, so um, why is um, self-custodianship so important for us? I, I, I think um, a little bit of background here. Um, the entire team uh, of Moon Wallet is based in Argentina. And we've been dealing uh, with uh, really a lot of issues uh, with uh, banks and, and institutions here for a long time. Specifically in 2000, 2002, uh, here in Argentina, um, we had a, a, a really huge bank run, which ended up in, in banks uh, not allowing um, people to, to take their money out. And so everyone could take up to, I think, um, $200 per month out of the bank, regardless of how much money you had. And so you, you basically had your money frozen. Um, and so I think that almost every Argentina, Argentinian that has like more than 15 years remembers this and, and has lived through, through this and, and through um, institutions abusing um, these, uh, their powers and, and, and actually having their money um, locked in, in some way or another. Uh, it was um, super traumatic. Uh, it was it, it was a really hard time, and, and many people had to deal with this situation for years. Uh, had to go to court in order to to um, recover the money, and, and maybe once they did, uh, they recover much less money. Uh, somewhat similar to, to what's happening now with MTOX, finally. Um, so so we have our own MTOX in Argentina. Um, and yeah, I, I guess that's uh, one of the main things, uh, as I was um, saying earlier, uh, before we got here, uh, that um, Argentinians understand the value of non-custodianship almost naturally, um, which is something that's re really cool. Uh, and, and it has been a, a really good place for us to, to have our early users and start understanding the problem and the product we should build. Um, yeah, uh, and specifically uh, about me, I was working in 2014 uh, for remotely from Argentina uh, for uh, startups in the Bay Area, and like like I was um, earning in US dollars uh, in the US, uh, but at the time there were really strong car currency controls in Argentina, and so I need a way to to get my money. Um, outside the US, like out of the US and inside Argentina. And at the time I, I used Bitcoin to do that. And it was awesome. Like it, it was the, the perfect uh, technology in order to do that. Uh, but it was super tough. Uh, it was super difficult to imagine like, hey, ha how can we get everyone to, to be able to, to access this technology and, and be able to do this and, and not be restricted by these um, controls? And so that's when the when the idea uh, of Moon started, uh, and it, it 
mostly remained the same uh, from that time. Um, uh, and so the, the focus has been how to make non-custodianship accessible to everyone. And we've been working on that problem for quite a while. Um, so we, we've developed some of an understanding of the problem, uh, which is um, what I wanted to share today. Okay, so one of the, 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 the cool things to, to frame the problem is to say like custodianship today in Bitcoin means uh, users leaving their money in exchanges. Uh, and that's a pretty common thing, uh, like almost everyone does it, uh, at least with a little bit of money. So, so we wanted to understand what, what should non-custodianship do or, or what, what, are, what are the remaining problems of non-custodianship today that make people afraid of taking their money uh, out of an exchange? Um, because most, mo most uh, newcomers are really afraid of doing it. Um, and, and so um, the three th things that we found were really important where on, on the one hand, making it really easy to use. How, how do we make non-custodianship uh, as easy as a regular application that users um, are already used to um, interacting with? Uh, Bitcoin breaks a lot of uh, the preconceptions about what an account is and, and how, how does it work uh, and the um, what can you expect when you lose a password and that kind of things. Um, and, and so one of the really important things is, is how do we get, we get it so simple um, that everyone can use it. Uh, maybe even without understanding so much what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so the second thing is people are not, um, unwilling to, to take the money out of, uh, of an exchange uh, because they have to pay a huge withdrawal fee. Um, and as we know, B Bitcoin fees are designed to go up, Bitcoin on-chain fees. And so uh, for us, um, it's a really important problem uh, to, to tackle, not only because today uh, it's already a, a really big problem, but also because um, as we go forward, um, it's going to become more and more important and it's, it's only getting worse. And so um, if we want people to, to not rely entirely on custodial services and leave their money um, in exchanges, um, it's, it's an important uh, thing that, that we should achieve. Um, and thirdly and lastly is the security aspect. Um, Bitcoin is, is really new. Um, the security implications of um, of holding your own money and, and being self custodial um, are, are are really big, um, and so uh, I think we are just in the early days of of uh, securely holding money in Bitcoin, uh, and most of the of the interesting solutions haven't been that much explored today. Uh, and, and so we had to, to break new ground in a lot of aspects in order to, to, to achieve a really secure setup uh, that are out of the box for users. Um, so first of all, um, one of the things that we had to, like, we had to, to change at least what we saw was happening at the time in, in the Bitcoin design space um, is that uh, most of the wallets in the early days, maybe the first generation of mobile, mobile wallets, were just like a reflection of the protocol, right? You, you, you had almost a, like a one-to-one -one relationship between the features in the protocol and, and the um, UI elements in, in a wallet, which was um, a, a really, I, I think the first approach, and it, it makes sense, uh, Bitcoin is super tough technically, and so um, the first step was, uh, well, hey, well, let's uh, just let uh, users interact with this technology without having to deal with, with the console. And that was a lot. Uh, but um, one of the things that, that we wanted to change was, uh, hey, okay, so, so 
most wallets are thinking about uh, the features and how they, they present the technology to users uh, from a, a, a perspective from protocol features, like what can uh, the protocol do? Let's, let's help users uh, do that. And we try to take uh, an entirely different approach and start with what's the experience we want users uh, to have uh, and then try to wrangle with the protocol and, and, and fight with it a little bit in order to try to, to achieve that. that. That's quite a lot harder uh, when you try it because uh, the protocol cannot do everything you want it to do. Uh, but uh, not only you end up, uh, I believe, with cleaner uh, experiences uh, for users, but only um, you have, like, that's, that allows us to, to have a clear picture of what we need and and what we need the protocol to do and we don't have today um and and, and so um try to focus on okay where where should we put effort like in which proposals or, or which um new um uh features for the protocol are important for us and, and so we should invest in yeah uh so, so that's mostly um what we what we try to do uh, in terms of our design process um, in order to 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 reach uh, the the user experience that we want, um, but uh, it's like a cross cutting concern, right? So so everything you do, you have to be thinking about what's the experience you want to provide and, and whether you want to to get these two, and uh, and in a sense that's that's asking the question like how do we make this super simple um and, and uh, i think that's what we try to achieve uh, that's the difference between mo that that's the biggest difference between moon 1.0 and moon 2.0 um and but but there's still a lot of a lot of work to do and i think it it can be uh much easier much simpler and and it will get uh, better and better as as the protocol advances and, and we iterate um, products and, and wallets and how we understand what Bitcoin is and what it, what it can do. The other thing that, that we wanted to focus on is this uh, thing where we, like, if you um, want to take uh, your money out of custodial services, then, then you're going to have to deal um, with blockchain and the network and the protocol, you're not just like a, a database entry um, in some for, for some custodian. Um, and 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 we know this is a really important problem to invest into because it, it's it's getting worse. Uh, we are right now we are seeing like uh, maybe members that aren't clearing for, for several months. Uh, we are seeing. Uh, unprecedented on-chain fees and 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 the block size is um, is limited. So this is only getting worse as more and more people uh, are using Bitcoin. Um, and so we wanted to to we try to work on this um, both on the on-chain and the off-chain layers. Um, and one of the reasons, like I think that's one of uh, maybe the, the differences between uh, Moon and other Lightning wallets. Um, for us, um, on-chain payments are, are, are super important and, and they are not going away, right? Because um, for, for high amounts, on-chain works really, really good and Lightning doesn't so much. Um, when you work, um, the numbers a bit, uh, you, f you realize that um, lightning fees are almost linear to the amount you are paying, which means that uh, as, the amount of, uh, as the amount of money you want to root uh, through a, a lightning payment goes up, the, um, the fees also go up. And so that means that uh, lightning is really, really good for small payments. But um, when you want to do a really big payment, uh, that's going to be much more expensive than doing an on-chain payment, which has almost constant fees. We wanted to provide a, a really integrated experience between both on-chain and off-chain and work the problems in both layers, right? And so um, we started with the on-chain layer and, and, and thinking about how, how can we make this 
uh, much cheaper than it is today. Um, and so uh, one of the first uh, things we realize is that uh, on-chain fees right now uh, and how uh, other wallets uh, deal with on-chain fees is super inefficient. Um, we all like as 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 a user, I, I always had the feeling that that it was kind of inefficient. Uh, but I, I can I convinced myself that it was a really difficult problem, and so you couldn't um, uh, you you couldn't guess uh, uh, much better than what was being already done. Uh, and we recurrently had um, new users uh, had. Also, this feeling where, hey, like I can do a better job manually. Why can't my my wallet do this? And and we always gave gave this answer of, okay, it turns out that that this is a real time market and fees are blocks come in a really hard to predict um, uh, sequence, and, and so you can't do better than that. Uh, and eventually, we got down to to uh, ask ourselves, well, let's test this. Let let's see if we can do better. Uh, than that, um, and it turns out uh, that uh, you can do much better than what um, Bitcoin Core does, uh, and and almost everyone in the space is using Bitcoin Core. Or, uh, now it's starting to change, but uh, we were all using Bitcoin Core's estimations. And one of the reasons that's like that is because um, if you want to, Bitcoin Core doesn't take into account the mempool data, and so it's really slow to adapt to, to rapid changes in the mempool. And so I, I guess three, four years ago, when the blocks never uh, were fully uh, filled with transactions, and so fees were really low, this wasn't much of a problem. But now that, that we have a, a really healthy fee, fee market, and, and um, th there's a lot of demand for Bitcoin transactions and block space, um, fees are super volatile, and so uh, being able to adapt really quickly uh, to, to changes in the mempool um, turn, turns out to be um, super uh, beneficial for the user, and you can save a lot of money, uh, especially in, in during weekends. Uh, you can you can save almost 80, 90 percent of the fees that you would otherwise pay uh, if you just go with the suggestions out of the box. And, and actually, once once we figured that, uh, we we understood that that was what almost every um, every proficient user was already doing manually, um, and and so uh, we we kept investing in that in order to to take this um, this uh, thing that only proficient users could do, uh, and make it almost. Um, like work out of the box so that everyone can benefit from that. Um, and, I, and I think that it's not only uh, useful for individual users, but, but also it makes the, the existing fee market much more rational and much more efficient, which is a, a great thing for, for the entire um, network. Um, so yeah, we're, we're starting to see other wallets and, and other um, uh, providers, uh, block explorers, uh, uh, invest in these two and, and um, try to provide better predictions and, and take into account mempool data. So, so that's really cool. Um, and besides the fee estimation, there's a lot of cool stuff that can be done, uh, but but isn't being done that much today, which is uh, batching. So, uh, batching was uh, in 2017 and 18. It was incorporated to a lot of um, exchanges. Uh, but uh, since we have RBF, uh, you could do something really cool for, for users, uh, which as they make transactions, you start batching them and, and use the, the on-chain space much more efficiently and make uh, and thus reduce um, the fees for the users. Uh, you can do with RBF also like an automatic uh, fee bumping, uh, and so you you try to to you guess super uh, like uh, uh, you tr you you make an estimate uh, that uh, has maybe eighty percent of chances of not getting in the next block, uh, but if it gets, you save a lot of money, uh, and then if you see that that you are not getting into the next block, you can bump the transaction a little bit, 
Um, and so the, the, there's a lot of things that, that can be done that are a little bit more sophisticated, but I guess um, we'll start seeing in the next couple of years. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, optimizations to be done and, and um, a lot of uh, stuff on the table right now without even introducing new protocol updates and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess that uh, on-chain fees and, and block space can be used much more efficiently and saving uh, fees uh, to the users. We are working on, on all that stuff uh, and it's, it's going to take, take time. It's, it's um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work to do all that stuff. Uh, but, but I guess it's, uh, it's important to, to realize that we're only scratching the surface uh, on, on what uh, efficient block, block space use uh, is today uh, with wallets. And so um, that's an important thing to work at for us. Um, well, then um, let's talk about off-chain. Um, one of the main challenges of, of implementing Lightning uh, was this thing where, uh, like, for us, um, it, it was super important to, to uh, not lose the cool properties that on-chain payments already have. Um, so on-chain payments are uh, completely trustless. Uh, you have full non-custodianship. Non, non, non um, and they are cheap, and you can like uh, you can um, choose what fee you want to use. And, and uh, uh, we have been in the last ten years learning how to how they work and, and uh, what properties they have. And so we wanted to implement Lightning in a way that wasn't um, that, that that didn't compromise any of those properties, but at the same time. It, it wasn't super hard to use. And one of the things we found that, that was um, a, a big stopper uh, for casual lighting use is that users, uh, like in, in most implementations of lighting um, before Moon and, and let's say uh, one and a half years ago, um, you have to put your money either on chain or off chain. And so, uh, if you want to fund your off-chain wallet, that means that um, you have to make an on-chain transaction with at least one confirmation, and then you can use that money. And so that means that uh, it, it, it has to be premeditated, right? So you can you have to plan on using Lightning and how much money you are going to want to use um, in order to, to, to do that. Um, and then once you do that, um, your money is kind of less liquid because you cannot use it to, to make an on-chain transaction. And, and so you had these uh, like two different boxes where uh, if you put your money in the on-chain box, then you can just do on-chain stuff. Uh, moving the money between boxes um, is expensive and it's, um, it's slow. And then if you put your money in the off-chain box, then you just can't do off-chain stuff. And so we wanted to, to, to kind of just have a single balance, a single box, and let users uh, do whatever they wanted. If you want to do an on-chain payment, do an on-chain payment. And if you want to do an off-chain payment, do an off-chain payment. Um, and yeah, and so, so we began with uh, a, a really simple, um, Submarine swap implementation, uh, which let us um, start to, start to to um, experiment uh, with Lightning in a way that that was uh, really natural for us because we we were before being a Lightning wallet we were a non chain wallet and so we already had all the non custodianship stuff. It it turned out to be a, a really interesting way in which we could move. Um, iteratively uh, from a, just a summon swap implementation to a full uh, lining implementation uh, without uh, compromising non custodianship in the way. Um, and with Moon 2.0, we got to the point where it's, it, it starts to feel like lightning. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done um, on that front, um, but uh, I, I think we are getting there. Um, that, uh, and yeah, uh, we, we are working the problems. We already have like all the pieces. Um, it's just a, a matter of implementing it, uh, which is a lot of work, 
Um, but yeah, uh, so so that that's our thinking right now with um, uh, off chain uh, off chain stuff and and how to merge the experience of on chain payments and, and off chain payments and trying to to change the mental model uh, where you don't have your money. Like it's not that you have your money on chain or off chain. The, it's that the payments are on chain or off chain, and you, you, it's all your money, and you can do like either kind of payments whenever you want. Yeah, the on chain, off chain stuff. I think that's really interesting, and you know maybe you can talk a little bit more later when you get into it, like how that actually works in terms of, like, are you when you are you closing a channel to then pay an on chain uh, request, sort of like use those UTXOs for instance. Um, yeah, so, so yeah. Um, a little bit of, uh, of our vision of where, where this has to end up um, is, so the idea is that um, if we manage to, to get uh, all of the users' money um, in, in payment channels all of the time, then it's really easy to make, uh, to make and receive off-chain payments. But then you you have to figure out how how you do on chain stuff, and so you, you have mainly three problems. Um, one of the, the first problem is how do you receive uh, on chain payments and and end up in this uh, cool state where your money is off chain all the time without incurring in a, in a lot of um, on chain fees because you had to open receive and then open a channel and then what you do in the middle and all that stuff, and so. Uh, the idea here is to um, use something that we're calling uh, non-interactive channel opens. Uh, and the idea is that when you receive an on-chain transaction, that same transaction is opening a channel between you and Moon. Um, and, and so it opens a channel non-interactively. A third party is opening a channel between you and Moon in a non-interactive manner. Um, that that the full uh, non-interactive channel experience in order to implement the, the, the uh, pure non-interactive channels, you need an opcode that's not uh, in Bitcoin today, uh, OpCTV, uh, which is uh, Jeremy Rubin's uh, work. Um, but th there's like a couple of hacks you can do in order to, to get that right now uh, in, in the like, the downside is that by doing that uh, today, uh, you had you had to make your channels expire, uh, and then uh, it gets a little bit everything gets a little bit more tricky. Um, but it can be done today, and so um, that that's the first idea, right? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting, actually. I think, yeah, I mean, it's just the whole concept of even if all the opcodes aren't quite there yet, it sounds like that option of when you receive on chain, you're essentially trying to open a channel at the same time. And then when you, if you had to spend on chain, potentially you would be negotiating some channel closes. Yeah, it's just, it's a really yeah. cool concept. I mean, yeah, I know really... you're going to go into later about how you back up all the state, because that's probably a big part of it, but yeah. that's, um, yeah, that's actually very cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so one of the cool things is that you are getting your money, your like on-chain payments, uh, you, you can receive on-chain payments and you're getting that on-chain money into, uh, off-chain payment channels without having to pay any fees, right? Because uh, it's it's a fee that the sender is paying anyways to make the on-chain transaction. And so um, that's really important in order to, to save fees there and, and preserve this uh, off-chain state of your money uh, where all the money is off-chain all the time. Um, then you have to figure out how you make outgoing on-chain transactions. Uh, and so in order to do that, there's an old idea, uh, old in lightning time, um, an old idea called splice outs. And, and that idea is that like actually cut through splice outs uh, in which you can close multiple channels, um, make an unchained transaction, and with the, with the change, reopen a new channel. Uh, and you can do that without having downtime. Right, because you do a, a couple of tricks in, in, in which you preserve both the old state of the channel and the new state of the channel. And so you can do um, off-chain payments, even though um, the, the splice out hasn't confirmed yet. Um, so uh, that's the other part of the, of the puzzle. Um, 
Splice outs are really hard to implement. Um, it, they have, they kind of break uh, the the payment channel concept, uh, especially if you do the cut through versions where where you do it for multiple channels at the same time. Um, and, and so it requires a lot of engineering to get right and to to um, actually. Um, get it to work uh, w without downtime. But the, 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 the no downtime part is the one that makes it really hard. Um, but it's, it's been worked on. Uh, the, there's been some recent developments um, by the C Lightning team uh, on this front. They, they, um, they managed to, to implement dual funding, uh, which is a prerequisite uh, for, for splice outs um, and splicings, I guess. Um, and so, um, one of the interesting things is that um, we don't have to implement the full splice out version. Uh, Moon needs uh, a smaller problem, and so it's much more viable uh, to do it. And so, we are working on that um, and, and on a reduced version of splice outs. And so, um, if you have the, these non interactive channel opens and the splice outs, then you can both uh, send and receive money off chain, and you can send and receive money on chain. Um, but then um, it, you have the problem that th the third problem is that uh, when you want to receive um, money uh, off chain, and and and, uh, and and when you want to send money uh, off chain, and maybe your channels have expired. Um, not not always you not always have uh, all the liquidity you need, you need in payment channels both either outbound capacity or inbound capacity and so we had to to um to work on on that problem and, and it, like that's one of the toughest uh ux uh points right now in using lightning you had to figure out how to solve uh, th that issue? Although it's, it, it looks like a small issue, um, it, it's it's one of the the toughest things to get right. And so, what we did there, um, we we use a, a, an idea that's been going around for a while, uh, but uh, to our knowledge, no one implemented it, um, which is something called virtual payment channels. Uh, and the idea is that. Um, it's kind of like um, in a in a lightning payment. Uh, a lightning payment is composed uh, in several hops, and you like you can have an intermediate. Like uh, if if uh, you take one of those hops and one of the parties agrees with the other party that the payment has been made, uh, then for for the rest of the of the uh, peers uh, in in the lightning payment that just works out and they are fine with that. Um, and so you you can have this um, kind of um, custodial hop uh, in in the in the lightning payment and no one uh, like uh, it just works out. And so that that's virtual payment channels like uh, you have like you just agree uh, that that. Um, like both parties agree um, that uh, I have this amount of money and you have this amount of money and you just move from one side to the other, um, which is super efficient capital wise, um, but uh, it's custodial. Um, so, so we want to make it non-custodial. And so we, we figured that um, we could make them uh, just unilateral. And so, if, if we make it, if we make them unilateral, then um, it's like it's non-custodial for the user. The user can just receive money, um, send money uh, through a virtual payment channel, uh, but cannot receive. And so, uh, if we do them just one way, we can make them non-custodial. But then, uh, Moon has a lot of uh, like uh, risk of getting uh, our money stolen. And so um, we made them tiny. And so uh, these uh, tiny unidirectional virtual payment channels um, are, are really cool in order to, to get a nice UX. Uh, but like if, if someone wants to steal that money, they're going to have to pay almost as much money as they would be stealing. 
um, and as, and so it's it's super low risk for Moon, um, and and users um, can make the payments uh, without incurring in any custodial risk, um, and so it it has uh, it, it it let us uh, like patch those um, those small like UX issues here and there. And, and actually, it's a really good tool in order to, to say, hey, like, uh, for example, this, you know, like a user wants to receive money through the Lightning Network, but they, they don't have any bone capacity. Um, so we need to open a, a, a payment channel uh, towards the user, but that, that involves some, some on-chain fees. Um, and so by using uh, these virtual payment channels, uh, Moon can uh, maybe uh, put the money for those fees and, and move the fees later uh, in, in the user flow uh, to somewhere that, that's expected from the point of view from the user uh, and, and maybe uh, um, pay but the channel opens um, in, in future payments uh, and, and spread um, the, um, where the, the, the fees are. And so it, it gives us a lot of flexibility into um, how we uh, show these fees to the user and, and what UX uh, we want to achieve. And yeah, and, and so th those are like the three main the main points of, of our Lightning implementation. Right now, like we have the, the full uh, virtual payment channel implementation uh, working in production. And, and the other two things, uh, the, the non-interactive channel opens and the, and the splice outs, we are working right now on, on, on a single use uh, payment channel that has um, those um those properties uh, which is our next iteration and, and then, then what remains is uh implementing the the channel revocation stuff uh, and so getting the full advantage of of the payment channels but that allowed us to to go from a pure uh splice uh, a pure uh summary swap implementation iteratively into a full payment channel implementation and so we we kinda um, we are kinda turning uh, the summary swaps into full payment channels. Uh, I can talk. It's like I can talk. No, for that's five cool. hours that's, about that. But yeah, that's great. I don't want to derail you, but that's the yeah. that's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Uh, so so that's that's mostly how we are thinking about uh, both um, on chain and off chain uh, payments and and how to make them super cheap. Uh, in both fronts, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, and I think uh, in the next couple of years we're going to see uh, much better wallets, which much smarter and efficient use of, of funds and, and block space, uh, which which I think it, it will be super beneficial because um, right now we we always when uh, as an ecosystem when we talk about uh, scaling and, and and block size efficiency, we focus on on protocol changes and, and what can uh, the protocol do in order to, to feed more transactions. But there's also a lot of work from the wallet side. Uh, there's a lot of a, a lot of stuff the wallets can do in order to, to use the block space more efficiently. Um, and so I, I guess the next couple of years of scaling uh, after Taproot are going to be mostly um, wallet side, um, which I think um, it's going to, to, to provide a lot of um, re release a lot of the pressure right now uh, because there's so many optimizations to do. Okay, um, so security. Um, when we started thinking about um, making a, a mobile wallet, um, it was kind of crazy for us to, to just put a, 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 a private key in there and, and be done with it. Um, although uh, phones are one of the maybe one of the most secure devices uh, a, a person has. Um, it's usually much more secure than, than a laptop or a desktop computer and, and, and users have them uh, all the time. So, so it's a really good fit um, for, for where to, to implement uh, a Bitcoin wallet. Um, it's, it's like a single point of failure, right? So if anything happens to your phone, security-wise, all your money 
is compromised. And so um, it was important for us to, to, to make that much more robust, uh, but for everyone, right? Because um, multi-sig multi or, or um, cold solutions um, are much harder to use today, uh, much more like five years ago, they, they were um, super hard to use. Um, it's getting easier and easier uh, as, 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 we, as the ecosystem evolves. Uh, but uh, so it, it was really important for us to, to um, try to get a really high um, security setup uh, for people that are just um, getting in, into Bitcoin and starting to, to learn about Bitcoin uh, without having them to understand a lot of stuff. And so um, we started working on a multi-sig solution um, pretty early um, and we settled for a, for a two of two multi-sig solution where um, there's, there's two keys uh, that are needed in order to move the money. And one key is in the phone and another key um, is in our servers. And so that allows us to, to do a lot of um, cool security features uh, where we, we have like a, um, everything can go wrong with the key in your phone, but we have like a second, um, a second stage in order to, to try to avoid um, any security issue. And so, for example, um, by having um, those two keys, um, you are not only um, protected against uh, the, the centralized, like the centralized risk of exchanges in which like a, a hacker uh, maybe uh, gets the keys from, from the exchange, uh, but you are also protected against um, any um, security issue that might be uh, present in your phone. And so um, an attacker should uh, both compromise our servers and compromise your phone. Um, and for example, uh, we can let uh, this reflects in practice um, in features, uh, in a lot of uh, interesting features that could be done in a phone, uh, in a phone wallet, for example, um, we could uh, let users uh, like if they if they lose their their wallet, uh, we could uh, let them uh, freeze their wallet until um, until they, um, they they set up uh, their wallet in, in a new phone, and so uh, we kind of have this uh, security feature that that's super common in the traditional banking system. Uh, but 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 now uh, with all the uh, with all the cool properties of Bitcoin, um, we can implement two-factor authentication where where maybe users have to uh, input a, a security token, a, a one-time password, or, or um, a, a hardware uh, like a UV key or something like that. Um, and unless that's present, uh, the server is not going to, to, to allow the transaction to go forward. Um, and, but, but in order to do this in a non wallet manner, um, we also have to let users um, move their money without any collaboration from the server, right? Um, and, and so that, that trying to solve that problem faces us with the challenge of, of uh, understanding uh, much more deeply what non-custodianship is, uh, what what does it mean in a in a multi-sig context, um, and, and what a backup is, what recovery is uh, in a multi-sig context, and and we found out that that um, coming from a single sig uh, background and ecosystem, a lot of uh, a lot of things that that were actually different were meshed together. Uh, and so we had to do the hard work of, of figuring out uh, how to think about them. Um, and, and so, for example, one, one of those things is, is the, this distinction between hot and cold. Um, so so you, can, you can talk about uh, hot storage versus cold storage in a single key setting, but what about when you have multiple keys and, and maybe some of them are hot and some of them are cold and, and and so you, you have a, like a full spectrum of options uh, where you can have maybe uh, like a two of three with two hot keys and one cold key, which is a, a really common setup for exchanges. And is that a, whole, a, a hot 
uh, setup? Is it a cold setup? Um, it's kind of a warm setup. Uh, and so um, we, we had to, to stop thinking about uh, hot versus cold um, in order to, to be able to understand uh, the, the different security levels of different setups. One of the other interesting things is that we had to understand uh, exactly what non-custodianship meant uh, in order to, to replicate it uh, in, in a multi-sig setup. And we figured that uh, when we say non-custodianship, we, we actually mean two different things, uh, which are super different. Uh, one is the non-seasability aspect, which is that um, the, the wallet provider should not be able to move your money. Uh, and the other one is the non freezeability aspect, uh, which is that the wallet provider should not be able to, to freeze your money. And so, uh, for example, um, the, the non freezeability aspect is, um, is just like you can get to, to a non freezeable state. Uh, if you like, the user can get to a non freezeable state if they have enough information, if they have enough private keys and enough. Uh, metadata in order to be able to recover the money. That means uh, public keys, that means um, uh, derivation paths, that means uh, scripts, and a lot of other stuff that, 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 that you get once you start to do more complex things, things like Lightning Network. Um, and, and so non freezeability is, is really cool because once you, you have it, um, you, you have it and, and that's it. Uh, but non seasability is more of a security issue, right? It's, it's if you model the wallet provider as an attacker, uh, what are the things that protect you from uh, the wallet provider? Um, and, and so like in the same way as security, it's a cross-cutting issue, like you can lose it at every point, like if you do uh, anything wrong in, in, in any a step of the way, um, you might lose non seasability And so you have to think really differently uh, between those two properties. Um, and so in a, in a, in a multi-sig setup, uh, non freezeability means um, you just need enough keys. And so in, in Moon context, um, that means that the user needs to have access uh, to the two private keys, since it's a two of two setup. And so uh, when you make a, a full backup in Moon, you, you end up having uh, two private keys, actually, and, and all, the, all the metadata needed in order to, to swipe those keys. Um, and, and so um, we, in that way, we solve non fritability and, and we have and, and non seasability in practice means okay. Uh, so um, Moon, the wallet provider, uh, has a key, but it can never have have two keys uh, because uh, otherwise it, uh, the wallet provider could move the money. And so um, it, it's uh, it makes it much easier to evaluate a, a multi-sig setup. Uh, it's splitting these two concepts. Um, so that was one of the things that, that we had to, to kind of understand in order to, to tackle um, the multi-sig setup for Moon. Another interesting thing that, that um, derives from this uh, separation of concepts is that um, when there are multiple parties with different keys, um, you can do different, uh, like, like you, can, you can have uh, multiple ways to, to recover access to your money. Um, and so um, you can have a really easy to use collaborative recovery process as long as you have like a, a non-collaborative process that, that's usually what, that, what, what gives is non freezeability property. Like you have to be able to do that, but that doesn't mean that you need to, to use it all the time. You can do something much more secure and much more easy to use uh, for day-to-day -day use. And, and so uh, when we started to think about that, we realized that uh, we were putting too many constraints on mnemonics in the single-seed world because we wanted to make them work for both 
uh, flows. We wanted to, to make them really easy to use for, for a day-to-day -day recovery, but we also wanted to, to uh, have all the information to, to work um, for uh, like a completely non-collaborative uh, recovery process. And, and, and we were asking a little bit too much, and so they weren't like the best solution for any of the problems. Uh, when, when, like, what you find out uh, as you uh, as you use Bitcoin and, and for a long time is that uh, recovery is, with mnemonics is always painful. Like, you have, like, there's a lot of metadata that's not included in the mnemonics, uh, like the derivation path that that your wallet is using, like, like the script type that the wallet is using, and and that's not even talking about wallets that. That that have the the um, the scripts evolved throughout time, so so the wallet needs to to keep uh, producing features and, and introducing new technology. And for example, now you're going to have a taproot, and like what happens in, in the recovery process if if you don't have uh, somewhere uh, documented which um, script types you are using, um, and so mnemonics kind of fall short uh, for, for the fully non-collaborative um, recovery process. Uh, and, and once uh, you, you all evaluate them on the, on the collaborative process, then they don't take advantage of this collaboration. Um, and, and so the, there's, a, there, there's a lot of neat things that you can do if you uh, UX wise, uh, if you take advantage of that. And so in Moon, we, we kind of had to split those two recovery processes. And, and so we optimized each of them uh, for, for what, it was, what it was being used. And so you have this kind of multi-factor authentication for day-to-day -day recovery. Uh, and, and you have this like two-layered uh, system uh, for um, the completely non-collaborative recovery, where you have like a PDF that doesn't have any sensitive data, but it has all the metadata needed in order to recover uh, your money. It has uh, the encrypted private keys. Uh, it has instructions because, because most users don't know what the steps uh, needed in order to recover the money are. So it's, it's a really important part. And, and also, you might have to recover your money like years from now. So it's, it's not a uh, guarantee that you are going to remember what you did with that money. And you also have your output descriptors, uh, which is like a, this uh, new standard to document uh, all, the, all the stuff that your wallet is doing, like what duration paths uh, the wallet is using, what script type is using, uh, that kind of stuff. And so since we have that there, each time we we have to like we want to introduce a new technology, say like Taproot into the wallet, we just add a, an extra output descriptor, and you have there documented all the uh, all the scripts that were used to produce uh, UTXOs for your wallet, um, and, and you can do a full recovery regardless of, of when you installed Moon and, and uh, whether you used. Uh, Taproot or SegWit or, or compatibility addresses, um, and and it allows us to to evolve as a as a wallet uh, without having to to create like a a cluster of different wallets and and difficult to manage uh, recovery uh, different recoveries uh, for each uh, kind of address. Um, and then there's an extra piece of information in, in the in these emergency kits, uh, which is uh, how we call the, the PDF. Uh, that's uh, it has um, a lot of metadata attached in a in a in a machine readable manner. Um, and so um, when when you use our uh, recovery tool, um, you can just like uh, send like. A, take the PDF and it will read all this data from the PDF, which might include, uh, in the case of, of uh, payment channels, the commitment transactions and other more dynamic data uh, can be included in the PDF. And since the PDF um, doesn't have any um, sensitive information, uh, it, it doesn't have any information uh, to allow someone to, to move the coins, but also it doesn't have any information to, to find your UTXOs. 
Um, we it's it's secure to to store it in the cloud, sync it to the cloud, and and maybe make as many copies as you want and update it as you go, and so it gives a lot of flexibility. Um, and and we have the user um, write write down in a piece of paper a recovery code that they can use in combination uh, with this PDF in order to decrypt all the private keys and 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 have this extra um cold uh security um and yeah so so that like splitting these two concepts the concept of uh, like a collaborative recovery for day-to-day -day usage of the wallets and, and non-collaborative recovery allowed us to 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 craft um recovery methods that were compatible with um multi-sig with lining and with with technologies that that need much more uh that ask much more of the recovery system uh, of the backups that are much more dynamic um and maybe uh, have a lot of metadata needed in order to 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 actually recover those coins um so yeah um th that's that's um i guess one one of the other things that that um do do i need a moon wallet to recover my funds can I recover uh, yeah. funds using a different wallet? Um, so uh, right now, in order to like, if you want to do the non-collaborative um, recovery, uh, which is the one that that you would use in the case that Moon disappears or, or, or anything like that, um, you have to use a recovery tool uh, that that's in our GitHub, and we have like uh, backed up in. in, in uh, the the internet archive and, and many other places, and and we are trying to move in a direction uh, to to make it interoperable, and so we are starting to move like uh, invest heavily in output descriptors uh, and and which is the technology that that allows us to that will allow you to eventually uh, make for example a full recovery uh, with uh, Bitcoin Core and without having to to uh, to use any uh, piece of of technology um, right. made, made by bitcoin uh, yeah, but you how would that work with lightning channels though like how would i be yeah. able to recover it with lightning channels because i get it from yeah, multi -sig. So, yeah uh, so so for multi sig it's it's this output descriptor scheme uh, for lightning um, it's um, so the idea is to to include um, transactions that can be broadcasted um, by by the user in this metadata, um, and they have to be encrypted uh, with the recovery code in order to to uh, keep this uh, this property of the emergency kit being uh, super um, like. Uh, you don't risk anything by by having it in the cloud. So so you we don't have want to have like plain um, transactions uh, there who like that your cloud provider could broadcast. Uh, but the idea is to have like ready to broadcast transactions uh, and um, also uh, one of the the interesting properties uh, of of our payment channels and where, where we are going is that our payment channels expire. Um, and so uh, in the, like worst case scenario, you just like, if you couldn't broadcast those transactions for any reason, if you just wait uh, long enough, all that all the payment channels are going to decay into regular on-chain transactions. And so you're going to be able to swipe them uh, with, with a regular, uh, say with Bitcoin Core. Would it be sent to your multi-sig wallet? I'm sorry? With that, so with the channel that eventually expires, would the funds then go into your multi-sig wallet? Your Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, in, in the case in, into the regular two of two of moon. And so uh, you, you will be able to swipe it as any other uh, moon output. That's actually pretty, that's actually very useful. Um, what? Um, hmm. How long is the timeout? How long are these channels designed to? So, right, so, so right, right now, um, um, this is not present right now because uh, we still don't don't have these channels, uh, and so uh, in the next iteration, we're going to to introduce this. Uh, it, it comes together with the non-interactive channel opens. 
Um, and so uh, we're not sure yet, but uh, it's going to be in the order of multiple months. Um, because um, on the one hand, you, you want it to be um, small in order to, to have this like extra, uh, it, it's a, it's a, a like a last resort recovery because you do have the, the transactions that you can broadcast. Uh, yeah. But um, if you want, if you need to access this last, uh, last resort, uh, then you want it to be not so uh, long in the future that uh, it's it's uncomfortable for the user. But on the other hand, you won't want to to your channels to be expiring all the time. And so it's it's a difficult trade-off there. Um, we we are uh, right now we are tending to 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 think it in, in like make them as long as we can. Um, it, the protocol has a limitation where you, you can you cannot make them much more than a year in the future because that's that's a limitation of, of um, of what you can do with with CSV, um, but um, so it's going to be something between a couple of months and a year. Uh, not sure yet, uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, and the idea is that users shouldn't need to use this, uh, and so the idea is that the PDF will be updated each time uh, you deal with a channel, and so you you have all the metadata you need. But if for some reason you lost uh, the, your latest state, or, or you, you lost, um, uh, or, or you stored it in, in, in not in a cloud, but but maybe in, in a like a colder setup, even you you, you printed um, your PDF, uh, we want that to work anyways, right? Because right now in Lightning, if you lose the state, you lose everything. Um, and, and that's not so. That's not acceptable for us uh, because, like, a lot of people do. Um, and so we want you to to preserve this, like, this last layer. Maybe, like, if you lost your your state, it, it will be somewhat uncomfortable because you're going to have to to wait a couple months. Uh, but you're going to get your money back anyways. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, and so um, that was mostly it. Uh, one of the other differences that I, I, I wanted to, to point out, which might not be obvious to everyone, is that um, mnemonics um, have a ton of problems. <laughs> um, and mnemonics uh, are hard to deal with, um, and, and especially one of the, of like, they, they just don't work for a multi-sig or, or for a lightning setup. Uh, because, because you 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 have other keys, you have other private keys, you have other public keys, and they they cannot be included inside the mnemonic. But even in single C, you had this all this metadata need in order to recover your money. And the way we were dealing with this as an ecosystem was like documenting. Every like all the metadata that every wallet had at any moment in time, and, and having this like huge matrix in walletsrecovery.org, where you had to like go there and try to guess uh, where like which wallet uh, you used for that like five years ago, uh, and then uh, in which years you created the wallet, and from that try to figure out. Uh, which uh, duration path your wallet uh, used, and, and uh, did you did you use Segwit or not, and and all that stuff. Um, and, and I think we got used to that uh, as like being the, the norm and, and how how uh, Bitcoin worked. Uh, but it it does not have to be like that. It's not um, it's not something inherent to Bitcoin. It's something that that. Uh, we got uh, because uh, we were using mnemonics. Um, mnemonics are super cool. They, they solved a lot of problems at once. Uh, but but once you you start to to try to get a, a cleaner UX and, and try to solve um, all these uh, hard problems for people that might not have the expertise um, to to go to walletrecovery.org or, or or to try. To, uh, understand that if they try to recover the money and, uh, and import it in, in uh, their city in another wallet and they see the, their balance zero, they 
it, it, it might be okay. Uh, it's just trying another wallet and another wallet. Um, but it's super hard for newcomers to, to, um, uh, to, to have them go, th go through, through that process. And, and it's, um, super traumatic, uh, when, a when a user that doesn't understand all the tech, um, suddenly believes that, that they lost all their money. And so, um, I, I guess, um, like n not so many people are paying attention to, to the work that, that. Uh, Peter Will is doing uh, with output descriptors, and I think um, I think uh, it, it's it's definitely a, a, a direction in which we should mo move as an ecosystem, and have like be prepared to 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 uh, maybe ha have to innovate a little bit on on what a recovery looks like, uh, but but that has has a lot of upsides. Uh, we had uh, multi sig for I don't know eight years now, I, I believe, and, and we weren't using it because it was so hard for users. And, and actually output descriptors are, are the solution to, to all these problems. Um, and we have a lot of really cool technology incoming uh, with Tabroot. A lot of cool things can be done with Tabroot, but if you're use, actually using Tabroot, like uh, these new features that Tabroot gives, then you have still more metadata uh, that's needed because it's not on chain. Uh, it's it's like the clients have to remember it, and so uh, output descriptors are, are are the way in which we can um, have all these metadata uh, documented in an interoperable way. And so uh, I think it's a really cool standard, um, and I hope we see more and more uh, as as we go forward. Um, but yeah, we have to make that transition, and we have to be willing to pay the cost of, of maybe uh, dropping a, a standard that that was working good enough, uh, and uh, and try a couple new things and see how they work. Okay, and um, so that's it. Thank you, thank you for for um, listening. Uh, and and if you have any other questions, I, I'd be happy to answer them and, and talk a little bit. Actually, I, a quick question. You were mentioning the, the output descriptors. Are you are you currently using output descriptors? Is that part of your your current wallet? Yes. Yeah, so so um, in the in the emergency kit, in the PDF file, uh, you have documented all the output descriptors that that your wallet is using. Um, okay. uh, and uh, so we are preparing right now for, for an upgrade. Uh, to our lining scheme, uh, and and that will introduce new output descriptors, and it's just like a, a an update to the um, to the emergency kit where you just like add an extra output descriptor, and it just works out, and that allows you to 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 have like multiple like uh, different kinds kinds of UTXOs because um, you might have like in the same wallet a UTXO that was paid to a save with address and, and another one to a top root address and another one with this new version and, and not have to to like it allows us to not have to choose between either having like exposing different wallets to the user that that's what uh, what was done by by many um, wallets say uh, like um, hardware wallets usually like when you wanted to use like a new technology like like Segwit you just created a new wallet and then you have this problem of the same problem with Lightning you have to choose where you you have one or the other um, and and you either do that or, or you have to migrate all your funds from the old technology to the new technology, which is super expensive and and you lose all the privacy. Um, so actually ha be having a wallet that, that can understand uh, different UTXO versions is super important in order to, to be able to iterate the wallet. Um, and yeah, so, so we do have them uh, and the recovery tool right now um, uh, uses them uh, in order to to swipe the funds. Uh, the, the 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 only detail there is that uh, we are using uh, uh, one um, non-standard feature uh, for for our output descriptors because like the standard output descriptors are not um, do not provide uh, privacy because they need to have either the private key or the public key. Um, there and instead, like since we wanted our emergency kit to be um, 
like uh, not run any risk and either uh, a security risk or a privacy risk by having it in your cloud provider. Um, we instead are using the um, the key um, the um, the hash of the keys. Uh, yeah, the fingerprint yeah. of the keys. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and, and embedding uh, the keys encrypted in the in the emergency kit, and so you have these um, output descriptors that tell you all the metadata, but do not leak uh, neither the private key nor the public key. And so, um, with, with both pieces of data, the encrypted keys and the output descriptors, so you can recover your money. Uh, but yeah, uh, that that's a, a slight difference with the output descriptors standard. Yeah. That makes sense though. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Dario? And I'll just, I'll just also add that um, anybody, if you want to go to the moon website, um, you can download their wallet. It's as I understand it's Android or iOS. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, very cool user interface. Very, uh, I've played with the backup and recovery. It's, it's very easy to use. Um, this is definitely the future of wallets. I think the on-chain, off-chain um, seamlessness. That's you know that's where things are going. So it, you know, this is uh, this is just your 1.0. You've made a lot of progress <laughs> towards your Andrew. goals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, there's Andrew, yeah, a lot of work to be done, though. Yeah. Honestly, I'm like I'm like hella impressed with just. Um, how you've thought about making lightning and on chain useful and less chaotic for the end user. Like how much did you, like uh, how much user research uh, did you do throughout this whole process? Yeah, a ton. Um, so we started with Moon like almost five years ago. Uh, we started being like uh, two people coding uh, for, for a couple of years. Um, and, and like we made every mistake possible, uh, user like UX wise. Uh, uh, and so, uh, we had to iterate a lot. Um, we, we were pre like, um, we were in a, in a close beta for quite a while, just in Argentina and, and learning, uh, and talking uh, like every day, uh, with the Argentinian community and users and, and like closing that feedback loop um, and, and iterating. Um, it, it was like, it took a long time because iterating uh, with non-custodial setups, it, it's quite hard. Like um, changing one setup to another takes a lot of work. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the errors were painful to correct. Uh, but, um, but I guess uh, it, it forced us to, to really understand uh, where users were coming from uh, and uh, what what stuff mattered to them and what didn't uh, and what was actually like uh, the root needs. Uh, uh, we, yeah, like talking with a ton of users, like uh, almost every day. Um, and we, we luckily have a, a really um, close um, connection with the Argentinian community that's getting larger by the day. So it's a, it's a really, it's been a really, um, like a, a, a cool iteration hack, uh, having all that input and, and also having users, like it's important to, to, uh, select your users, uh, which users are you going to, to pay attention to? Right. And so our Argentinians have, have the non citizenship aspect super clear uh, and it's, um, you cannot forget about it. Uh, and that's been super great for us. Um, they didn't let us, uh, forget about, uh, why we were building this and, and, and what the, the end goal was, which is something really tough once you've been like five years working on a project. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Quick question. Um, um yeah. do I have to be online to receive a lightning payment. Yeah. Um, so, um, it, you have to be online because uh, the the wallet has to release uh, the pre image. Um, the, uh, while you are offline, the payment is going to remain on hold, and so you hold it, right? Uh, so your note holds it, and then when yeah. we come online, it'll get pushed to us later. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So, so uh, like uh, th there's two out outcomes there. Uh, if if eventually your phone um, comes online, then then the payment is going to proceed and and, and you're going to complete the payment. Uh, but um, the payment might uh, expire before you do that, and in that case, it's going to be fail and. and yeah, that, that just works out as, as a regular um, lightning payment failure uh, and, and the money goes back to the sender. Um, but yeah, um, so, so that's one of the reasons we, like you can play with that uh, by the, the, there's a parameter in the, in the lightning invoices called the, the final CLTV um, delta, uh, which actually lets you configure uh, how much time do you want in order to 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 wait before it, it expires for the last hop? Um, and so we do play uh, with that in order to to try to to get most payments confirmed in time. Um, there is just like a, a long tail of payments that might take a, a, a quite a while, and, and those payments might fail. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the best you can do today uh, for for aligning wallet mobile wallet. Um, because you do need connectivity in order to receive the payment. For sure. Cool. I think, uh, Lawrence, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, hey, Dario, thanks for that. That was pretty cool. I'm actually a user of the wallet. Uh, lately, I've been working, uh, kind of educating and onboarding some uh, new users. So I'm looking at making Moon Wallet one of the ones I recommend. The one question that I did have uh, that I was unclear on is when you export that emergency kit, uh, when something is new, so when there's new code or something implemented, such as Taproot, does that mean we need to export a new emergency kit, or how uh, often should we be looking to uh, refresh that document if that's uh, if that's necessary? Yeah, so um, we are working on that right now. So, so the, the update procedure of, of the emergency kit, um, and and the idea is that uh, each time. Um, we have like a, a new feature that, that touches how UTXOs are produced, maybe changing the script or changing the script type or, or, or um, the duration paths or, or something like that, which kind of happens like two or three times a year. Um, before producing any UTXO to, to one of those addresses, we'll have the user uh, re-export uh, a new emergency kit if they happen to to um, to uh, back back it up to the cloud, then we can just like the user doesn't have to do anything. We we just like let the user know that, that that's going to happen and and have them uh, proceed with it, with it. But but they don't have to do any uh, manual export procedure. Um, but if you happen to use an, uh, another uh, backup mechanism, uh, which is not the cloud. Um, then uh, you will have to um, to do an export if you want the new features. Like if you don't want them, you you can just uh, not um, not export it, and it's going to be fine. It's it's um, so we we made it in a way that there, the money is not uh, on, on risk of being lost at any time, right? So so we aren't going to 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 use a new feature until we are sure the user has exported the new backup. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you got answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. I didn't know that you guys have the ability to update that emergency kit uh, while that document sits in the cloud. That's that's new information for me. Yeah, I, I mean that that depends on, on what the what what the user chose, and we aren't going to to update it uh, without uh, knowledge from the user. Uh, it's it's something that that the user will have to approve. Um, but uh, once it does, uh, it, it just works out uh, without any further interaction uh, because um, being in the cloud, we can just upload a new emergency kit uh, and you won't lose any of the historical emergency kits. It's a non-destructive update. We'll just add, add a new uh, PDF document, uh, but we, we want to be really careful of not like touching any, um, any other backup that the user might have. Um, and so um, the client um, is is taking care of of not destroying any any previous backup. Got it. Thanks, Dario. Appreciate it. No, no. Thank you very much. That was an excellent.
talk. Um, very great uh, technical stuff going into that, and I look forward to uh, to watching how it progresses. Yeah, thank you for having me, and it was a pleasure, and, and, and uh, glad to be here. Thanks, Mario. Thanks You're welcome.